Hello, welcome back. In this last video for this chapter, we're going to use an example of stick and shake. So please uh, pause the video, download the template from Canvas, and we'll get started. The template includes all the assumptions. There are a lot more uh, numbers here, so I didn't ask you to tap it in. Um, but let's go over them a little bit. Uh, the first assumptions uh, is uh, quite familiar. Uh, this is the long-term growth rate. And this is the long-term growth rate for, in this particular case, um, we simp uh, the company, we simplified um, the income statement such that comprehensive income equals to net income. Uh, again, the complexity doesn't change the principle of valuation. The cost of equity is 9.34%. This is, remember, this is the required return. And we have the um, retained earnings account. Um, so in this case, again, we assume that in the future, the only way that the company is going to um, return cash to investors is through dividends. There will be no stock repurchase and there will be no issuance of new stock. So common equity um, and retain on the change in retain earning uh, will be one and the same. So we will just, um, the only thing that will be added to common equity is through additions to retain earnings. We also have the statement of uh, very simplified statement of cash flow. We have state, uh, cash flow from operations, uh, cash flow for investing, uh, for financing, which includes debt. Um, and again, as far as equity is concerned, the only cash flow uh, involved is uh, dividends. It's important to note the forecast horizon. The forecast horizon, uh, let me make sure we emphasize that. Uh, the forecast horizon ends in year 10. We included year 11. Um, year 11 is already based on the long-term growth rate of 3%. Um, we did not include the detailed calculation of how um, basically what we assume is that um, net income, uh, every all the items in the income statement, you increase by 3%, and then that will automatically link to changes in networking capitals, um, meaning current assets and current liability. And then, um, and those will, has been incorporated into cash flow from operations. So, uh, if we went over in details how to do uh, financial statement forecasting in a, a different chapter. So uh, this simplifying assumption in this column assume that all those work has been done and that's how we come up with net income and also cash flow from operations for year 11. Our first valuation model is the residual income model. So um, I have created the um, forecast horizon. So once again, the forecast horizon ends in year 10. So uh, the model goes from year zero to year 10. Um, residual income is defined as comprehensive income. And in this example, comprehensive income is the same as net income. So comprehensive income minus uh, period equity. So it is the ending equity of the prior year times the cost of equity. Once again, cost of equity remains the same. So I'm going to make that an absolute reference. So that's our residual income. And we can copy that for the next 10 years. Then we have continuing value and we have, um, so once again, if you don't have the formula handy, make sure, pause the video, go get your formula. I really encourage you to um, try to write the equation on your own um, and then you can double check and then you can play the video to check that you get the correct um, formulas. Right, so continuing value is equal to comprehensive income in year 11. Once again, in here, it's not just a simple growth rate because we assume that it would, um, we work, we, we run it through the income statement. Um, 
minus the period's common equity times the cost of equity divided by the difference between the cost of equity and the long-term growth rate. So that's our continuing value in year 10. So let me make sure I specify the time. And then we add this two up. So this is the residual income plus continuing value. Now we can find the present value Present value, we use the MPV function in Excel. The discount rate is the cost of equity, and the value to be discounted are the future residual incomes. And remember, we have to add back the initial book value. So book value is in year zero. And that gives us the total value before the mid-year adjustment. So that will be the sum of these two. And then the value after mid-year adjustment is this value times 1 plus the cost of equity divided by 2. So that's how we'll compute the value using the residual income model. Next, we're going to use the same um, information, but we're going to compute the value using the free cash flow approach. So the free cash flow model, uh, once again, is a 10-year investment horizon. Um, if you, this is covered in a prior chapter, so if you don't have the formulas handy, please once again pause the video, get your material, get your notes, and we'll work through this together. All right, ready? Here we go. So the first item is cash flow from operations. Remember, we have this in our assumption area, but we don't want, um, we don't want to include value in the model area. And then the second item is cash flow for investing. Again, that is also from here. Uh, we so also have cash flow for long-term debt. Um, I want to emphasize this is the free cash flow for common equity model. Remember, we have we can compute free cash flow in two ways. And then the, the last item is to add back cash for transaction or liquidity purposes. So that is the opposite sign. So we'll change the sign by putting a negative sign in, the, in, in front of the change in cash. So we are putting in three, $3 million in this case. Um, because we have we increase uh, we reduce cash by three million, so that means that we have three million dollars that is free and available. So this is free cash flow for common equity. And once we create that the formulas for year one, you can just copy it over for the next ten years. In addition to cash flow for common equity, we also need to compute the continuing value in year 10. This is a continuing value based on cash flow. The continuing value in year 10 is the cash flow in year 11 divided by the difference between the required return and the growth rate. So we will add up 
the cash flow from year 11. And that's the cash flow from operation, investing, long-term debt, and minus changing cash. And then we divided this by the difference between the required return and the growth rate. So that's our continuing value. And we can add these two up and that will give us the total cash free cash flow. So this just the sum of these two. And then we can find compute the present value of free cash flow. <laughs> Once again, we use the net present value and the discount rate is the cost of um, cost of equity. Notice that those two are very similar. We are off if you run this to zero decimal places, then both will be 472. So that's very, very close. Notice that the distribution over time is very different. Um, for the residual income, this is much smaller, but you add back in the initial book value. Whereas free cash flow includes all the cash flows that are returned to the common stockholder. Um, and we also will do the adjustment which is the same adjustment. We take the value times one plus the cost of equity divided by two. And not surprisingly, they are again, very similar. If we run these two zero decimal places is 494 and this will also be 494. So far we have looked at three different models. One is the residual income model, one is the free cash flow model, and then we have the dividend based model. Uh, in this particular example, because the cash flow, as you can see here, is the same as dividend. The free cash flow among each year is the same as dividend. And this is not surprising because the only cash flow that we get back to shareholder in this um, company are dividends. So the value using the dividend based model will be the same as the value you get for free cash flow. We can also do sensitivity analysis. And in this case, I'm going to look use the cost of equity. Remember, that's always uh, that's a factor that can be potentially um, challenging to estimate and it has a great impact on our estimation. So our base case is 9.34%. So let's say we will let it go from 7% uh, to 12.5%. You can choose any value that, that is meaningful to you. Um, so we're going to look at the impact on the two models. So, um, so the first one is the value using the residual income model. And that is computed here. And the second one, we're going to look at the impact on the value computed using the cash flow model. And that will be located in cell B43. So formatting is useful. Um, you can, there are a lot of options to change your formatting. And this is these, so to include the data table, we highlight the entire area. Remember we only have one input, so we can have multiple output. 
Let's load data, what if analysis, data table. Our cost of equity is located in a column. So we will use the column input and cost of equity is located in cell C5 in our model. So let's take a look at the result of our sensitivity analysis. Let me change that to zero decimal places. And you'll notice that yes, cost, um, cost of equity, as cost of equity goes down, value goes up as cost of equity goes up, value went down. Uh, but the two models give you very similar uh, results regardless of the cost of equity. So you see the similarity in the model valuation. Now, of course, this is an example that, um, that is created. Um, in the real world, you may end up finding that the value could be quite different. Um, in fact, it's a good idea when you do valuation to use more than one model. So if you, if you are using the dividend-based model, also use the free cash flow model. Uh, if you're using a residual income model, then also use either the dividend model or the free cash flow model. We'll, uh, fin we'll conclude our video for this chapter here. I'll see you again soon in the next chapter.